Okay. So welcome everyone to the 2021 National Safety Report that we do uh, for the coming 2022 season. My name is David Donaldson. I'm the National Safety Officer with the Soaring Association of Canada. Um, to get started today, we are going to do a land acknowledgement. And land acknowledgements are kind of interesting to do virtually because of course, uh, normally we'd be acknowledging the land on which we are gathered. And since we are gathering from across the country, if you go to native-land.ca, it's actually an interactive map and you can locate the particular nations uh, that are on the lands that you occupy. The land on which we gather is the traditional territories of the Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations. This territory was subject to Treaty 19. We, recognizing, we recognize the enduring presence of indigenous peoples connected to and on this land. We are grateful for the opportunity to gather in this territory, work in this community, and commit ourselves to the ongoing work of reconciliation. So I invite you to consider which lands that you are gathered on and to adjust that greeting um, as appropriate. As we get started today, uh, I'll do a quick pre-fight briefing. I'm gonna be your pilot for today, pilot in command. Um, this is a highly interactive session, so we will be stepping into Mentimeter at particular times through the session today for your feedback and input. Um, it is really critical that we get that because honestly, folks, um, you know, I can, I can sit here and ramble on for three hours. That's not effective for anyone. This is about having more of a conversation back and forth. We will also be going into breakout rooms partway through to be doing some small group work as well. Um, our flight plan today is three hours. Uh, I've got two breaks planned at approximately the one hour marks and we will be adjusting those accordingly as depending upon where we are. So we put them at, at, a, at a appropriate time. Um, some of the behavioral norms, we are on Zoom today. Uh, so the classic of we're gonna keep people muted. I have allowed the ability for participants to unmute themselves. So if you have a comment question, feel free to raise your hands. I will be keeping a, an eye on the participant list to see if any hands are raised uh, to unmute, ask a question. As I mentioned, we've got built-in interaction. So we're gonna be asking you to um, you know, provide that back as we go through our session today. Um, yeah, okay. And other couple of quick features of Zoom. There's a menu bar at the bottom. Um, hold on. Yes, Blackberry BB BB1. Yes, this is Hugh Douglas here. Hey Hugh. Um, I'm hi. I'm unable to download. Is it Mint or Minty? If there's nothing to download, you just need to go to the website. And it, if if you can hold on to that, it'll be apparent when we get to that point. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And Hugh, are you on a computer as well as on your Blackberry? I'm only on my Blackberry. Okay. It might, it might be a little challenging for you, but I think you'd be able to work it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Okay, I'm just gonna lower that hand. There we go. Okay. Um, so in your menu bar across the bottom, you do have reactions. Um, and in there, you can raise your hand. Uh, you can also mute and unmute, as well as take a look at who the participant list is. Now comes the part where we're going to do our, our registration. So this is a Transport Canada approved webinar, but I have to take registration and I have to keep that registration for a couple of years as part of my contract with Transport Canada. So here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna open the chat. You're gonna type in your full name, first and last name, and you're gonna type in your license number. So I have a quick example on screen. For example, I would type in David Donaldson, GG294177. Please type in your first and last name and then your license number. And we're gonna pause here for a moment for, to allow folks to get that done. David, I gather for students, we don't enter anything here, but do you still want us to enter our name? Uh, for students, this is not a requirement because this is for your biannual flight uh, retraining requirements once you're licensed. So if you're a student, you do not need to enter. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Okay, so they are flowing in fast and furious. We will be asking you to do this again at the end. Um, this is our way of attesting the fact that you didn't come in for five minutes, enter that posting and then hit leave. So um, when I do the accounting at the end, I will be looking for matches. 
So uh, Mark Luchier with uh, you know, 828699, I will be looking for yours at the end as well. And if I don't find a match, it doesn't count. So whatever you entered in the morning, I'm gonna ask you to again, sorry, at the beginning, I'll ask you to enter at the end. Okay, and there's still a few flowing in, recognizing some of these names, awesome. Okay. So as we uh, give a moment for the rest of those to flow in, I'd like to get to know a little bit about the folks who are on today. So now's the time to pick up your phone, your other tablet, uh, whichever device you have. If you go to menti.com, oh. it will ask you for a code. Uh, there we go. See, I knew you guys. That's, that's auto auto doing. I hey, have a auto. question. Yes. Uh, where where can I put in my license uh, number and this? Uh, it, where what the, what I have to open? In the chat, auto. So if you can, you see where you mute and unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah chat. Yeah. Chat. Chat. Where Click on it? chat, and a little box should open. Oh, yeah, just a little chat. Yeah. yeah, and then just type in your name and your license number. The box should open. Oh, yeah, it's your name. Uh, there's somebody else in there. Yeah. And I can put my name yeah. in there. Yep, down oh, the yeah. bottom. Good, thanks, yeah. Thank okay. you very much. And it looks like most people have figured out how to do the Menti piece. Um, if you're still struggling with it, just go to menti.com. The number is there, 13550. 025. And once you enter that in, um, I've allowed multiple entries. So if you are an instructor and a glider pilot and a board member, you can you can put all of those in. And we've got about sorry, sorry, minutes. Dave, what what is that uh, menti thing? I must have missed something. You see on screen right now, Jan, at the very top, it yes. says go to menti.com. Oh, yeah. Okay. And then you enter that code. And the question will be there and you can fill okay. in the poll. Um, if you have a second to monitor, you can do it there or you can do it on your phone. Yeah, okay, very good, thank you. Looks like the glider pilots are having a party. <laughs> All right. It's a, a coronavirus mutation. <laughs> uh, David? Yes. Uh, I don't know how to uh, register. I'm Antoine Babin. Antoine, uh, you know how to do a chat in Zoom? Uh, nope. So, do you know where you know where you went to go unmute yourself? No, I see a participants discussion. Écran partagé. Go to the Go to the discussion. Discussion. The yeah. Chat. And you should see yeah. some names in there with people's like you'll see Susan Snell and a TG. Yeah, that's why I see. Yeah. Yeah, right below that, there's a spot that says type your message here. Oh, okay. Click there and type, and I would like your first, last name, and license number. Okay. Are, Avind, did I get your name okay, correctly? Yeah. Thanks, David. I just had a question. What are we downloading from menti.com? Your, your PowerPoint? No, you're not downloading anything, sir. Just go to menti.com, enter that code, and that will allow you to participate in the conversation. Okay, thanks. Okay, we've got 112 who have responded. We've got 157 on today. So we've got a good good number in. Okay, so this helps me identify and understand who we are talking to today. Um, we've got close to 100 glider pilots. We've got 37 instructors, 19 tow pilots. We've got 14 students. Very happy to see the students joining us today. Um, also very happy to see the number of board members who are joining us. And I think that's fairly indicative of the, the level of commitment and dedication we have within our sport. Okay, and I see your correction there, Mark, got you, thank you. Okay, we're gonna get moving on. Our agenda for today, we're gonna start off with a review of the National Safety Report. So I'm gonna give you some of the highlights to that. Um, the actual report itself will be available on the SAC website if anyone uh, has difficulty finding it, please feel free to send me an email and I'm more than happy to uh, share that with you. Um, the big focus for today is around risk management and soaring. 
looking at the concept of active versus passive soaring uh, safety. And this is really centered around threat and error management, which is our current thrust within flight training and safety. Um, some safety initiatives. This is gonna be our open conversation. And um, we're gonna be asking some questions of you of how do you improve safety? We'll be putting you into small breakout groups. We'll be using Menti to continue to collect our input in our data. We're gonna finish off today with something called an I commit to statement. Um, this came out of the world of Boeing uh, where we're basically as individuals, we're, we're publicly declaring what we're gonna commit to doing in terms of advancing safety. My opening thought for today comes from Carl Weck. Um, errors is pervasive, unexpected. The unexpected is pervasive. What is not pervasive is well-developed skills to detect and contain errors in their early stages. And I'm just gonna highlight the contain errors and early stages because, and we've been talking about this for years, but the more we can get in front of these things, the more that we can identify the errors early on and take corrective action early, the um, sooner that we can um, you know, correct that error and then met, hence make it um, something where we don't lead to the, the accident, the larger piece. With that in mind, I'm gonna do our second poll today. What is your plan for 2022? Now, this may be in the form of, what are you talking about? It's a standard year, dude, we're, we're doing everything normal, right? It may be we're skipping the spring checks or it may be that we're, you know, we're planning some enhanced spring checks this year. And this will help set some context for uh, what we're gonna talk about later. So once again, I'm gonna pause, give people a few moments to respond. Um, Hugh Douglas, I see your, um, your registration there. Uh, I don't see your license number though. I only have GC and Antoine is the same. You've, you've entered your name, but I need your license number, please. Yeah, can I provide my license number later on or no? Uh, if you could just pop it into the chat would be appreciated. I, I'm not at home actually right oh, now. Oh, okay. And what is your license number? Just read it out to me. I don't know it offhand. All right, I will, if you could email me later, I'll, I'll add it. Um, I will definitely do that. Wonderful. The mentee code is at the top of the screen. Thank you, Dan. Okay, we're just approaching 100. There we go. Okay. So it looks like the majority, about two thirds are saying this is a standard year and about a third is saying, you know what, we're gonna do some enhanced spring checks this year. Okay. Give it a few seconds. I wanna get to that hundred number. We're at 99 we just need one more. No? All right. There we go. Awesome, thanks guys. All right. Um, here's a quick, oh, sorry, John, John, go. Um, did, did my did my uh, fill in come in on the chat line? It um, shows differently. It shows differently on the on the rest. It shows as a private chat to you. Okay, you know, I think private chat to me also works. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, here are the numbers from last year. Uh, first, taking a look at the accidents, we had ten accidents, which was up three from the previous year where we only had seven. Uh, we had 173 reported incidents versus 147 of the previous okay. year. Our number of launches was up a little bit. Um, so we went from 10,205 launches reported in uh, 2020 to uh, 12,446 in 2021. So, you know, 2020 was a real pause year, was a difficult year. It was a, it was a stuttered start. It was uh, many people taking the year off waiting for the pandemic to settle down. Last year started to feel a little bit more normal and we're starting to see more of a return to previous. Um, if I look at earlier averages, we're usually running around 16,000 to 18,000 flights in a year. So there was a definite drop over the last two years and I fully expect that we'll probably see numbers more in the range of 15,000 uh, in the coming year. 
as you can see, airmanship and landing are the two big areas when it comes to accidents. If we continue forward, uh, the incidents of this year, again, airmanship and landing, although we're seeing a bit of a, a spike this year in the takeoff um, ones. Now, the landing side of things, we're always going to see higher numbers here when it comes to reported incidents and accidents, just because we're, we're getting to terra firma. So those mistakes that we make higher up that we have margin for are the real ones that, um, you know, as we get into the landing phase, you know, we, we kind of can't really avoid. Airmanship, though, continues to be and has been for many years the biggest, um, the biggest piece. And when we think about that, this is our biggest opportunity for improvement and enhancement. Um, we take a look at the technology. You know, Rob, I'm looking at those nice gliders parked behind you in your, your background. Um, and the technology really hasn't changed much in, in recent years. It's, it's actually quite good. And we're seeing very few failures in terms of equipment. Um, and it's really airmanship that's going to be our biggest opportunity. So we've got a big focus on that as we, as we continue forward. Now, when we went into the pandemic year, um, there was a big concern around the number of incidents, accidents per flight, because we got a bit of a heads up before our season started from the US. Now, in the US, going into the 2020 season, when the pandemic first hit, they had a dramatic drop in um, number of activity and number of flights, but they also had a dramatic increase in the number of insurance claims and the number of fatalities, to the point where the insurance company was warning them that things were about to get serious from their perspective. Fortunately, uh, my colleagues in the US gave me the heads up. We were able to you know, make that awareness here in Canada, and we had a very good couple of years. Um, in 2019, we had 96.3 flights per incident. That jumped to 69.4 flights per incident in 2020. Now, what this means is, you needed to do nearly 100 flights before there was something happening. In 2020, you only needed to do 70 flights and something was happening. So we're having a lot more stuff happening per flight. The good news is in 2021, we improved that statistic. We went up to almost 72 flights without something happening, but we've still got a lot of room to go. So the good news is the work that we're doing is helping and we need to keep doing it. Um, and and I'm, I apologize if I'm getting your name wrong. Avind? Sorry, you're muted, sir. You're still muted. We're not hearing you. Arvind, you're muted. Sorry, sorry, sorry. There you go. Um, so don't worry about my name. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> I'm used to it being bashed around. My <laughs> question was, is the change in number a question of definition of what is being called an accident or an incident? No. Okay. We're, we're, we haven't changed the definition for many years. Um, we don't have the high enough quality of reporting to really create that level of, of consistency. Um, from what I'm seeing in, in my, I think I'm at this five or six years now, um, it's been pretty consistent what is being recorded and how it's being reported. Um, last year, I did see a drop in the amount of reporting. Uh, I think people got a little burnt out with COVID and I'm hoping to do a little bit of a reset and get us back to where we used to be. But thank you for that question. George. Yes, David. Um, I think incidents is a good thing because I, I find in too many occasions, people don't want to report things mm -hmm. when they should be reported and put on the table so that people can get on top of the situation. And I, George, I 100% agree with you. Um, but to Arvind's point, you know, if we don't have, it's more about having consistency year over year than um, having simply more reported incidents. Um, so it is something where we can look at this as a, as a lagging indicator of how we're doing, it's not a leading indicator, and we do want to shift towards leading indicators more. Okay. Um, we also had some feedback through the SAC insurance. And as you can see in 2019 and 2020, we had spikes. Um, we had the overall loss ratio spike in 2019. Um, this was in part due to a fatal accident. 
um, but we had the hull loss ratio really spike in 2020. And what this tells us is that we were breaking more gliders and for the ratio of number of gliders that were um, registered or, or insured through the SAC insurance plan. So we had 297 insured aircraft in 2019, we dropped to 250, and yet we had a higher number of uh, claims happening. So we, we did see that. The good news here is in 2021, those numbers have come back down to something that is more indicative of the average, uh, getting us back back in line. So um, it definitely you know took a hit there, but we're kind of getting back into uh, where we want to be. Now, part of my work as national safety officer is I do look at the national statistics, but I also look at the international statistics. So I have a number of colleagues around the world that I do work with. Uh, in Germany, Sweden, France, England, US, Australia, New Zealand, and doing some work with Alfred Ust. Um, he's with the Phillips University in Hamburg. He is a statistician, and he has been tracking accident incident results uh, for much longer than I have. Now, one of the things of note here is that on average in Germany, there's between 900,000 and 1 million glider flights. And the reason that I bring this up is because when you get to that level, to that those numbers, you can actually have better statistics. When we are down and you know sub twenty thousand flights, we have one accident. You know we have one fatality. That's one fatal. You know that's one fatality per twenty thousand flights. Um, when you extrapolate that into you know what does that turn into in a million flights, um, it's not really kind of viably statistically relevant. But having said all of that, um, Alfred looks at not only Germany, but also other countries. And what we saw was in the late 80s up to about 1990 to the mid 90s, there was a dramatic reduction in uh, fatal accidents in Germany. And we look back at what we did in that time. This is around when we introduced SMS. This is around when we introduced a lot of the safety measures that we're doing today, like safety reporting, like the safety management systems, like um, you know, doing safety audits and, and these types of things. So they have had a dramatically good effect. But since then, we've had a relatively flat line. Now, the two lines, um, the two lines here, the orange one is the five-year rolling average, and the blue line is the, the raw data. So what we've done is, is looked at, you know, what's that five-year rolling average look like? And as you can see, we're relatively flat. Now, what this tells us is that the work that we're doing has worked and continues to work, because if it wasn't continuing to work, we would have the numbers rising. But it does tell us that we've effectively reached saturation, where the methods that we're using have basically brought us as far as they can go. So we need to now, we need to do that next big, you know, what's the next innovation? What's the next new thing that's going to help us, again, further reduce those numbers? Um, I see a, a note from George in the chat. Any numbers from non-SAC insurance claims, uh, would these be any different? I have not seen any numbers. I don't have access to any of those numbers, George. Um, if, if you've got some, you know, access to some of those or, or could direct where we could get those, that'd be great. But uh, I don't have access to those. Okay, um, here is what we're looking at in terms of fatal accidents. And this is just raw numbers of fatal accidents. So as you can see, back in 1989, we had four in that year. We went down to one, up to two, and so on. We had a really good span between 93 and 98 where we had zero. And this is around when we were very active in terms of implementing SMS and, and, and bringing in those types of measures uh, that we're currently using. The, the red dotted line is the five-year rolling average. And as you can see, while we had a short period of really good, uh, we kind of returned to, but actually averaged out a little bit better um, where we're kind of oscillating between one and zero. Um, and then of course we had our spike two years ago, but you notice we're actually heading into a downward trend right now because we've had two years of um, no fatal accidents. And I'm hoping, and our work here is, is really you know, focused on how do we keep that line flat on the bottom there so that we, we eliminate fatal accidents here in Canada. So all of this is to say, we've done some really good things to improve our records. 
we need to keep those things going and we need to you know improve and, and build on that back in 2018 i introduced the um wing runner checklist to help combat the open canopies and spoiler opens on takeoff i also started tracking gear up landings to see where we can start to get some um get some pushback or get some uh, improvement there. Now, what we saw in terms of open canopies, uh, we went from five to two to three, but then in 2021, we went back up to five. So we actually had an increase in two over the last year. Spoilers, similar story. We went from five to four to four, and then we're back up to five. And I apologize, I just realized I made a typo there. That should have been a plus one. Gear up landings, we had eight, eight. We went down to five, we're back up to eight. So we had a plus three over the last year. And really what this tells me is that um, we're starting to, while well, we had some temporary improvements, we're starting to uh, fall back a little bit here. Now, a quick poll, who does a wing runner check? This is the, I'm hooked up to the glider, I'm ready to launch, my wing runner would then, you know, ask canopy closed and locked, spoilers closed and locked, tail dolly off. And I appreciate those who are answering honestly, um, because you know it's easy in these types of situations to say, um, <laughs> "I'm a takeoff with tail dolly." Yep, and that's one of the things we're trying to prevent. I have not been uh, recording that, uh, Dominique, because um, no one ever it's never been reported. Um, so I'm seeing that about two thirds of our population is is um doing this always as a discipline so people are sometimes we've got a few who are who are saying that they never do that and okay i think i need to turn off the animations or the the annotations where is my menu there we go okay um so we see that a good two thirds of folks are doing a um, three quarters actually now, um, oh no, still two thirds, are doing a wing runner check. And we highly recommend them. Um, I know there are some places in the US where they will not launch you unless you've done a wing runner check. Do you mean when we run the wing or when the wing is run for us? Um, really kind of either because the wing runner is the one running the check. So here's how it looks. And I think I have a slide on this. I, it's coming up later. Um, I'm sitting in my glider. I'm ready for takeoff. You know, I've closed the canopy. I've run my sister CO check. The wing runner comes over, presents the rope, says ready for hookup. I say, yep, I accept the rope. They hook me up. Then before they walk out to the wing tip, they say canopy closed and locked. I confirm canopy closed and locked. Spoilers closed and locked. I confirm spoilers closed and locked. They'll look at my tail and confirm tail dolly is off. Then they walk out to the wing tip, do the all clear above and behind. I give the thumbs up and we, we roll on the takeoff. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. <clears throat> now we've made some progress, but we honestly were a little, um, we were a little kind of stalled if you will, because we've, we've, we've had a great improvement. We're now sitting at this, this level. So out of uh, Alfred Ulich's work, um, he identified five pillars of safety. All of these are built on basic safety knowledge. What you are attending today will give you some of that basic safety knowledge. So we think about safety procedures and emergency handling. We're good on those two fronts. Communication. I see this as an opportunity for improvement. Um, I know at my club, we do have some communication issues. Every club I've been at has, has struggled with this. The two big areas that we're going to focus on today is leadership, teaching, and learning. And every one of you who have signed up today, um, you are now building that, that last pillar in the teaching and learning piece. You are learning you know, some of this basic knowledge. You, you are participating in that. The I commit to statement at the end is really to address the fourth pillar, the leadership piece, because as a leader within our clubs, and we are all leaders within our clubs, regardless of our position, whether we're a student pilot, whether we're on the board or not, whether we're an instructor or not, whether we're just a, a you know a licensed glider pilot, 
you all play a leadership role. <clears throat> people follow what other people do. They see what's going on. You have an opportunity to stand up and say, um, that doesn't seem right. And, and maybe we should, we should think about this and do something about this. So, um, so when we think about that, what is it that you can be doing as you are going through it? And when you see someone who is doing something on the field that doesn't look right, you know, you have that, that ability. And in fact, I would actually contend you have, um, you, you have a, a, not a commitment. What's the word I'm looking for? You, 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 it behooves you to do this because someone could be making a mistake and not realizing it. And when you intervene, you could actually save their life. Okay, so as I mentioned, we work with our colleagues around the world. Obligation, thank you, Will. <laughs> um, we're working with our colleagues from around the world. So I wanna share with you what Sweden is doing. And Heinrich, um, super cool dude, uh, got to meet and fly with him a couple of years ago. Um, they have had a tenfold reduction in fatal accidents and accidents in general in Sweden over the last few years. And I wanna share with you some of the things that he's been doing. So just for comparison, Sweden is a country with 55 clubs, about 350 gliders and about 1500 glider pilots. So they're a little bit larger than us in terms of the number of glider pilots there. We're, we're running just south of a thousand. Um, we're also got about 26 clubs versus their 55. Uh, geographically, however, they're about the size of Alberta. So they're, they're a much smaller, physically much smaller country than us. Um, in 1990, they introduced a new training program. Uh, they also put a safety page on their soaring calendar and they got very um, prescriptive around approaching safety. In 94, they, they introduced a program called Stop Crashing or Stop Crashing 1. And then that was Stop Crashing 2 was added in 97 and Stop Crashing 3 was in, two, in 2000. Of note, Stop crashing programs was interactive sessions with each club. And I'm gonna highlight this. When you do safety training, when you have these conversations, it is a conversation, it is interactive. This is not a sit down, shut up and listen. This is a let's have a conversation. And this is very key to, to the success of these types of programs. If you lecture to folks, they will shut down, they will walk away. I heard a story of a glider pilot who joined a club. He, he was a licensed pilot, he had his own glider. He joined a club. When he showed up on the club, the safety officer marched over to him and started yelling at him and telling him what he's gonna do and how he's gonna do it and this and that. And that pilot got back in his car, turned around and left. And he went somewhere else. We need to build a good generative culture, one that's interactive, one where we're having these conversations. And to George's very, um, uh, you know, a correct point, we want to have open conversations, not having people hide things. One of the best framings I ever heard of this is when you share your mistakes, you're literally saving someone else's life. Because while I make, might make that mistake and get away with it, if George makes the same mistake, he might not be so lucky. So when I share the mistake that I've made with George and that avoids him making the same mistake, I've potentially saved George's life. Now, here was the result of this program. <clears throat> they had a tenfold decrease in the number of accidents <clears throat> to the point where they had zero in 2011. And then they've settled back into somewhere just south of a 10 on average. <clears throat> they had a dramatic improvement. And this was not new equipment being installed or implemented. This was not, you know, in, in introducing new technologies, this was quite simply training. This is about having those conversations. And in talking with Henrik, he said, the thing that really made this work is that it was interactive and it was done with support of the club leadership. So back to Canada, um, every year I like to highlight um, a favorite incident report and as I said, the full report is there. It's, it's open for you to read. Um, this one came in, um, several errors on circuit to land. Uh, note, this was the tow pilot's third hour in towing, entered downwind high, announced on radio, attempted to expedite the descent. 
um, turned final very high, started to slip, observed the glider on final ahead and 100 feet below. That's when he initiated the go round. During the go round, he got a response on his radio call for go round that you are on guard frequency 121.5. So there were several mistakes made, uh, in part because he was rushing. Now, here was his actual words. So this is unedited straight from the report. Um, this one was my bad. Had to take a break after tow. Uh, uh, had to take a break from towing for a few minutes after it happened, as I had to clear my head and decompress. But I feel there's a lot of lessons to be learned from both the glider and tow pilots alike. Complacency played a big role. There was a task saturation element. Um, he had done most of his towing with FLARM, and the incident aircraft did not have FLARM. I'm happy to report that the FLARM has now been installed in that tow plane. There was also some fatigue setting in as he was in his third consecutive hour of towing without a break. What are your thoughts on this? What lessons did you take out of this? So this is a chance for you to type in a sentence or two. While you're typing that, I'm just going to acknowledge Casey's um, and Mike's comments in the chat. Uh, conversations build ownership of an idea. Absolutely, Mike, we don't have those conversations. If I tell you it's my idea, you have no ownership. Um, from Casey, I agree with the message, um, but this, but had this graph started in 2005, would it look like this, like there was no change? It would be good to see prior years to get a better picture. Um, potentially, Casey, but at the end of the day, these are lagging indicators, and what we want to do is, is you know, move forward and look at, you know, what are the things that we see coming down that are facing us ahead so that we can um, get to a better spot point. And the reality is that situation where the graph started was their norm. Um, and they, they, they did some very prescriptive things to, to, uh, to address that. Okay. I'm seeing several things of fatigue, both in terms of, you know, identifying it as an issue, but also putting in some corrective measures like taking a break, taking a break, taking a break especially in smaller clubs, um, especially in smaller clubs, that can be a challenge. Um, at our club, we struggle to get two tow pilots for a day and we often have one tow pilot who does the majority of the day. Checking in with them frequently, removing some of the pressure, because um, when he landed, there was a lineup of gliders waiting for, for that tow to, to you know, take him up, right? Um, Mike is chiming in on the chat around the uh, dehydration potentially. Yep, I didn't check in on that particular detail, but that is a possibility. Uh, Richard's noting in the chat around, you know, they need to take a break every hour. From Glenn, relying on tow plane on technologies such as Flarm instead of a good lookout. Completely agree, Glenn. And this pilot, self-admittedly, and this is one of the reasons why this is my favorite one is he stood up and said, you know what, my bad, I made a mistake here. This is 100% on me and let's have conversations. So this, this spurred a lot of conversations around that club. Um, some other things, uh, more than two tow pilots on duty. This is actually one of the larger clubs in the country. This was from Sosa. They actually, I think there was three tow planes actively flying at that time. Um, so yeah, there's, there's, a, there's some, some issues there, right? Um, Tow pilots are our lifeline. Don't stay quiet. Suggest a break. Love it. Yes. And I think we should be doing that on both sides. So I will often walk up to the tow pilot, offer water, suggest taking a break, that kind of thing, checking in with them, right? Um, shouldn't be difficult for tow pilots to take a break. Agree. Exhaustion is dangerous. Absolutely. Um, I'm actually going to start recording and noting when accidents are happening early in the day versus late in the day because uh, someone mentioned this to me last year, I think it was. And um, yeah, it's interesting. I'm, I'm gonna be looking into some of that. Um, honest self-assessment, love that. You know, know your limits, stick with the COPs. Rushing makes one myopic. Ooh, that's a great statement. I love that, thank you. If you're getting tired, take a break, absolutely. And it, it can be difficult to identify that. Love it, this is some really good things here. I am safe is non-negotiable. Love it. Andrew, what's up? 
Uh, one thing you might want to consider uh, trying to get data on is what the temperature is uh, on the axiom. Because if you're towing for three hours and uh, the heat is hot and humidity, uh, it's substantially different than towing in the fall when it's nice and cool. Yep. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, Andrew, I'm I'm struggling to get the the reporting that I'm getting so far. Um, you know, so to get the more detailed is is a challenge. But I mean, you do raise a very good point. If nothing else, think about that in terms of when you step into the cockpit, how hot is it? What you know, what does the fatigue factor look like? And there's a good reason why a lot of countries in very hot climates have siestas in the uh, in the afternoon because you know what it, it is it is fatiguing to be out in the in the uh, in the heat. Okay. Um, thank you all for these these comments and thoughts. Um, here's, a, here's a big one on FLARM, which I like. Uh, FLARM only tells you where to look. It's a good device. Is not the be all and end all, which I 100% agree. Circuits are high traffic, expedition to see other aircraft. Uh, fatigue is a high, high factor here. And keep in mind that he was also expediting his, his descent. So he was coming down at a higher descent rate. Um, and if you think about this, we've got a, it was an ASK-21 with a student and instructor here in the circuit, you've got a tow plane above and behind about hundred feet descending. That's the exact same scenario that we had two years ago at CUNAM. Um, so we're, we're quite lucky that, you know, there was the extra diligence that he did have enough out there to, to identify that and avert the accident. I'm loving this note from Steven. Stopping to refuel is not a break. Many glider pilots think it is, right? Um, stopping to refuel, maybe that's a good time to swap, you know, tow pilots. Um, it can be included with a break. So if they do stop to refuel and take a few extra minutes, but you're absolutely right, Stephen, stopping to refuel is not a break, right? So just because the tow plane was, you know, not actively on the runway for a few minutes doesn't mean that that tow pilot had a break. Love it. Thank you all. Okay. Keeping the conversation going. Um, one of the things that we want to do is we want to shift away from a blame culture from a, you know, here's the mistakes we're making. Let's look at some of the good things we're making. And I've been encouraging folks to include some of those in their incident reporting because it is still an incident. We just caught it. And I'm really happy to report that we're getting more and more of these every year where people are reporting things that have started and then they actually broke the change. So here was my favorite catch of the year. A glider returned from maintenance shop with an elevator incorrectly adjusted. Factory calls for an elevator deflection of plus 17 degrees to negative 17 degrees. So 17 degrees up, 17 degrees down. When the glider was rigged for flight. So, I mean, just imagine this. You've just got your, your aircraft back from the shop. It had some repairs done to it. You think it's all pristine and ready to go. During the positive control check, the elevator travel did not seem right. Now, I'm just going to let those words sink in for a second didn't seem right. I don't know about you, but I will freely admit that there are things that I've gone down where it's like, yeah, it didn't quite seem right, but I sort of brush it off and kept going. When you are doing things like a DI, when you are doing things like a positive control check, if something doesn't seem right, pause, stop, think about it, ask a second opinion, do some further investigation, et cetera didn't seem right. They did that. They paused. They didn't go and say, okay, well, it's, it's working. Let's go. The deflection was measured at plus seven degrees, minus 27. So let's put this in the perspective of where the stick is at. Now, if I push the stick full forward, and I'll, I'll go sideways here, right? Here, let's do this. Okay, so here's the stick. Full forward, 17 down, full back, 17 up. With that misrigging, I would need to be about here for neutral versus here. So I'm going to be flying with, and, and, and let's see if I got it around the right way. I might have the, the forward back backwards. Let's not worry about that. My stick is going to be in a very different position to get neutral. And I'm going to have way more, because it's negative, I'm going to have way more down elevator authority. So it is back, actually. I'd be sitting back right here. I'd have way more down authority than I would up authority. So I'd have a very hard time lifting the nose. I'd have a very hard time, you know, taking off and climbing. But the moment I move the stick to a normal, like the, the center position, I'm, I'm diving at the ground. I mean, imagine trying to wrap your head around that as you roll down the runway and you're wondering why the heck is this airplane not working right? 
So thankfully, this was caught before the airplane was ever flown. They, they made the appropriate adjustments and they're, they're ready to go. Okay, um, I'm just noticing in the chat, I'm just gonna pause for a second. Someone's having a bit of difficulty with the um, audio. If you go to where you hit mute and you click on the little drop down at the little arrow there, there's an option to switch to audio settings and it will walk you through It'll give you it'll give you a prompt with all the stuff that you need to uh, get your audio switched over. Okay. So why was this my favorite story? And I think I just gave that away. <laughs> this was my favorite because people caught it before. Someone said that doesn't quite seem right, and they acted on it. Okay. So this speaks to rushing versus efficiency. And I wanna share with you literally a one minute video. And this is a video I use in my innovation work. And this video is gonna show you the Ferrari F1 pit crew team breaking the three second barrier for a pit stop. So they're gonna go through a pit stop in three seconds. Now. Last time I showed this, someone said, you know, they've broken the two second barrier now. So they've actually gotten even better. But I wanna share with you this, and then we're gonna have a bit of a conversation around what is rushing versus what is efficiency, okay? So one minute video. What are your thoughts? What is the difference between rushing versus efficiency? I wanna break this down a little bit. And so that, oh, well, I agree with you, training, that's a way to do that. And Dave Bax, um, yeah, <laughs> $12 million. Yeah, absolutely. There, there, there's a high investment here, right? Okay, so let's take a look at what we're talking about. And um, some of you are entering into the chat, but if you could go to menti.com, enter the code and do it there, please, because that will be captured within the session. Readiness, preparation, teamwork, preparation versus improvising. I would love to explore that a little bit more. So whoever put in preparation versus improvising, if you want to type a little bit more detail for us, or if you prefer to unmute and talk. Um, practice and planning, systems practice proficiency, you know, training, practice precision, uh, efficiency is planned, rushing is not, I love that description. Uh, many hands are involved. So we can have, um, if, you've, if you've got a finite task, if we can get more people involved, we can actually improve the efficiency, but you can have many hands and still be rushing, right? Um, so there is a resourcing element to it, I agree. Um, practice makes perfect, yeah. Um, I'm actually gonna update that. So I used to say that a lot, practice makes perfect, but practice actually makes permanent. So whatever you practice, that's what you're going to do on a, on a more ongoing basis. And for some reason, my, my scrolling had paused. Um, everyone knows their place, right? So speaking to the systems procedures, right? The, the clarity of tasks. Oh, I like that one, calmness. Right, so when we have that calm, we can be more efficient and, and not be rushing. And we've, we've talked about this in, in previous sessions in terms of having that mental state, right? Repetition, so speaking to the focus or to the practice again, right? Everyone knows their jobs, responsibilities. Key word there though, thoroughly. Um, you get good first, then you get fast. Oh yeah, there's some good one, absolutely. Workload is another one, that's an interesting one. Because when our workload gets too high, if we're looking at trying to get things done within a required amount of time, um, you know, when we get into you know concentration of tasks, 
you know, if our workload gets too high, we start to get into that kind of rushing mode, right? Efficiency is planned, rushing is unplanned, love it. Yeah, efficiency is able to perform at the same task with a minimal waste. Rushing is just speeding up, love it, yeah. Efficiency is the least number of resources to achieve the goal using training and defined tasks. Rushing is everyone trying to accomplish the same thing, but getting in each other's way. Oh, that's a nice one. Yeah, so I think we're kind of all on the same page here in terms of rushing versus efficiency. And when we get into a rushing state, we, that's when we make mistakes. That's when we miss things. This is when we, we start to do things in a way that will not necessarily create a faster result. Um, but, and especially if we put it in the context of safety, uh, would definitely create more risk. Um, just taking a look at a few more of the entries here. Um, training practice, a large enough team. Yeah. And that, that's actually kind of alluding to what we're about to talk about in terms of how efficient can we be? And what does that look like if we try to be more efficient within our environment? To be calm and cool, um, you know, was, was up there just a moment ago. So lots of really good thoughts here. Now, when we think about efficiency within our operations, if we get into a state of rushing, that's when people make mistakes, that's when things come unraveled. If we can get into more of an efficiency state, what we can be is more calm, we can be more um, professional about how we're doing this, and it is going to require some resources in terms of planning, in terms of, of practice, in terms of training, and this is where the leadership and the training and learning pieces start to come in. So if we take a look at you know where we are in terms of our safety records, but also where we are in terms of um, Oh, that, sorry, I'm just gonna, I just noticed a really good one here. Um, slow is smooth, smooth is fast from Nick Cage. There's lots of really good quotes in terms of go slower to, to move faster. Um, and yeah, we can find lots of those. And I totally agree. When you are smooth, that's what will create the efficiency. That's what will create, you know, getting things done faster. It's when we start rushing that, um, that uh, things start to come undone. So we're gonna pause here. Um, we're just, under the hour, whoops, okay. I meant to stop my share. We're gonna pause here, we're just under the hour. We're going to take a five minute stretch break. And when we come back, I'm going to put you into breakout groups and you are going to discuss with your team about how we achieve efficiency. And I'm gonna ask you to continue to contribute to the mentee conversation. So as you have that conversation with your team, you're going to discuss it verbally, you know, bounce some ideas around, and then I'm going to ask you to record your ideas in Menti. But we've been going almost an hour, so let's do a quick stretch break. Five minutes. I encourage you to turn off your cameras and mics. Get up, move around, have a stretch, reload your coffee, whatever that is you need, and we'll see you back here in five minutes. Uh, Mr. Donaldson, did you get my name and my uh, license number? Um, honestly, sir, there's so many in there, I, I wouldn't be able to really answer that at this point. I think I did see something about RLG as someone. Yeah, correct. Okay. I, I, I first, I didn't have my uh, my license number and I I had to, to get it after. Awesome. Yep. Your number's there. the recording there we go so one of the things to, to also think about is when we start to make adjustments to that and you know we think about a scenario where someone was using a, a pre-landing check they've now got the new updated one they're going to make that change and this actually 
actually happen where the person made the change, but that led to a gear up landing. Well, what they did is they made the change in the downwind. So instead of making it a, okay, you know what, I've had this one method or process that I've been practicing for years, we've decided to update that. How do we make those shifts? Because I've got this habit formed and now how do I make this shift and, and bring it around to the other way around? Um, I also noticed a number of conversations that really focused in on a lot of the details. And, and, and one of the things that we do a disservice to ourselves is that we start to get into these you know, nuancey conversations around which way is the best way and, and, and starting to get into some of those. Um, and this can negatively impact our efficiency. And when we are more efficient, we're actually safer because we're getting the jobs done. We're getting them done in a timely fashion while not rushing. And when we rush, that's when we make mistakes. So I asked a number of you to capture comments as you went in Mentimeter. Um, I see them flowing in. Let me just actually share my screen because I'm not even sure. Uh, I think I'm sharing my screen right now. Just to make sure. There we go. Um, so let's take a look at some of the different things that that came out of this. Create and implement a line chief manual. Train and designate an experienced line chief each day of operations. A designated line chief assist assistant to enhance communications between the flight line and the line chief. This is a good example of efficiency. This is a good example of, we need a little bit of structure, but we need responsibility. We need someone to take care of that. Now, based on that language, I'm gonna guess that came from one of our larger clubs. Um, I'm with Great Lakes Fighting, we're a smaller club. Um, we have effectively the same thing. We call them a, a field manager. And it's about thinking about, okay, does everyone know what the job is and, and how it gets done and what is the flow because one of the things that we wrestle with, and I've seen this at other clubs as well, is you know pilots are standing there on the field, they're socializing, they're having a good time, as we should. That's what the point of this is. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's my turn to go up. And you know the tow plane's landing. It's like, hurry up, get in the plane and go. Now I'm into rushing, as opposed to being efficient about how I do things. Um, so you know, we look at some of the other items on the list that are popping up here, things like using checklists, like under complete understanding, you know, practice, um, and really kind of knowing and understanding what's going on, right? So how do we define efficiency? Rapid glider launch, no damage to anything. That would actually be more of a, of a, a no damage would be a safety thing, but the rapid glider launch, 100%. Uh, we do need a known trained, oh, it just disappeared on me there. Um, I'm going to pause this when it comes around. So we do need to know and prepare and plan for what we're talking about. Um, I'm going to just pause the flow for a moment. Anticipation of knowing in advance what's coming. Knowing in advance what's coming. Practicing, repeating the method to review. Have new methods from other clubs. So looking around at other clubs, great idea. Um, pilots on the flight line should be completely flight ready, three positions back of the front. But the club culture should be very positive about people who want slash need to be pulled off and make a last minute double check for safety. This is a really good one because, you know, layering in that club culture piece, um, you know, the club culture should be very positive about taking someone off the line if they need to, to, to get, you know, something done, something changed. Um, preparedness goes a long way, right? Rushing is unprepared. Um, efficiency knowing in advance, uh, plan, do not rush, love that one. There we're back to the, the flight line uh, chief. Uh, efficiency is knowing in advance how to handle a situation, being prepared, uh, to be prepared, we need to fly a lot, right? So there's, a, there's a, a, a recurrency thing starting to come in. Unfortunately, our flying season is short and chances are rare, we forget preparedness. So let's think about that one for a moment. What can we do as an organization as we approach the coming season? What can we do to you know, help make sure that we are properly prepared? Um, encourage, and, uh, encourage a common objective. Need a responsible person, procedures, periodic training, awareness, distill some simple messages, encourage open communication, you know, lots of reporting uh, in regards to safety. Love it. Here's a really good one. Uh, train up, don't rule down. A <laughs> Steve Newfeld quote. Uh, love that one, and I completely agree. This isn't about rules. This is about training. This is about learning. 
uh, be ready to launch mentally and physically. A pre-fight is not a DI. Uh, we can't be specialized like an F1 team. So how to manage expectations of tasks. Now, if you look at that F1 team, there was three people. There's a team of three people whose job it is to change one tire. And if you're on that team, your job may be to just put the new tire on and that's it, or take the old tire off or undo the nut, put the nut back on. We don't have that and we never will, nor should we aspire to that. But what we can do is think about what do we have? How can we take some of these concepts and adapt them to our world, right? So that it, it becomes something where we've got something that actually works within our environments. Um, so rapid glider launch, so how do we define efficiency? Rapid glider launch, no damage to anything. Uh, do we need to, do we need a known trained, we do need a known, known trained process. Efficiency is the ratio of something we want versus the cost. And this raises a really interesting point, which I wanted to bring up in this session in terms of when we go for efficiency, because many clubs are trying to get more launches per hour, they're trying to get their, their numbers up, what is the cost of that? And are we willing, are we able to put resources to it? So what are the benefits? Um, never assume, et cetera. So there's lots of good elements around achieving uh, efficiency here. Now, I'm gonna move on to the next part and we're gonna go back into our breakout rooms again. This time what we were gonna do is we're gonna talk about balancing safety and efficiency. And I'm gonna give you about 10 minutes for this conversation. Okay, so give me a few moments here to just get my breakout rooms. I'm going to pause the recording because it doesn't work in the breakout rooms. And it looks like everything's set up. Okay, here we go. So I want you to have a conversation with your team around safety versus efficiency and how do we balance those two. Can I, can I ask? Oh, sorry. Okay, that was Mark. Witness protection program, Dave. All right, yeah, I think so. And I've just muted everyone because we're getting echoes, unfortunately. Um, again, you have the ability to unmute yourselves. And I'm just going to restart my share. I have restarted the, um, here we go. I have restarted the recording, so we have that. Okay, let's take a look at what we've got here. Um, from group, group seven, simple and scalable. I love that thought. Um, need to do a matrix of operations, see what is efficient versus safe, unsafe, such as location of fuel, fuel shack. Efficient, efficient is beside runway, but safe is far from runway. Getting away from rules for rules sake. Oh, that's so, that's, thank you, group seven. Um, music to my, my ears, so getting away from rules for rules sake. It's, it's not about setting out a bunch of draconian rules. It's about how do we, you know, structure our operation. I did pop into a couple of the groups and one of them we talked about uh, planning first and then training to the plan. So kind of figuring out what it is we're going to do and then let's, okay, let's plan, let, let's train to that, right? Um, safety first, efficiency second. Love that thought. Uh, efficiency can lead to safety. Now there's an interesting pair if we think about that, safety first, efficiency second. But if we are efficient and not rushing, and this is where I really wanted to this year really think about, you know, as we try to get ready in time to get the thermals or, you know, to get our slot in, in takeoff, are we being efficient or are we rushing? Um, so first establish some best practices, safe practice habits, 
then practice them efficiency will will follow. So you know again to that whole let's plan these things and then and then build to that. Um, consistency leads to efficiency. Yep, totally agree. Um, it isn't balance. Hmm, this is an interesting one. Efficiency requires focus on what's important, and that drives safety. Distractions reduce safety and efficiency. Kind of like that thought. It's it's about you know how do we because when we are efficient versus rushing, we're inherently going to be safer because we're we're getting the job done. We're moving down the path. We actually get some some you know if we think about last year's session when we talked about um, uh, you know dopamine. Um, oxytocin and serotonin, you know, those good brain juices that help us think better and keep our brains clear. When we have achievement, when we get things done, we feel good about that. We actually feel good about ourselves and our brains actually start working better. Um, so that can all, you know, it's a sort of positive loop, this positive feedback. Um, implementation of safety protocol first, then rehearse to improve doing things safely. Loving that, absolutely. Um, okay, so we'll continue to scroll through here. Safety is more important. Once that is sorted out, we can worry about efficiency second. Uh, sometimes efficiency opposes safety, aka redundancy is not inherently efficient. Okay. Yeah, it can, it can feel that way for sure. Uh, safety is a culture of a good operating club. Love it. Uh, it doesn't sacrifice what may be looked either efficient, uh, what may be looked at being efficient over being safe. Yeah, so again, you know, kind of finding that balance. Um, by considering what aspects of an operation might be shortened or removed to become more efficient. And now we get back into that whole, you know, where do we find that balance? And, and let's really ask ourselves the question, is this something that is a make work project? Is this something that is actually enhancing the safety, kind of helping move things forward? Or is it, is it we're just doing it because we, we, we want to? Um, perfect practice makes perfect. Love that one, yeah, because practice makes permanent. Efficiency can lead to haste, which can lead to tension, which can be destructive. Safety over efficiency. All members need to value efficiency. Yeah, absolutely. So we got to find that balance because we're always going to have a need to get things done. And efficiency is going to play into that. Okay. Um, so some really good thoughts here. I'm loving the, you know, safety first, efficiency comes. And it is a little bit of that chicken and egg because the more that we're efficient, the more that we're we're well-purposed in what we're doing, uh, the more we can build on that safety for sure. Okay, so let's take a quick look at this from a slightly different lens. Um, I'm gonna share with you two actual safety reports that I received over the last couple of years. Both of them involve a 2C glider. Both of them are Grobe 103s, actually. Um, and as, as you probably know, and if you don't, uh, the Grobes have a, are a little bit notorious in, in closing and latching the canopy. They can, it can look closed and latched and it's not. So on takeoff, the rear canopy open, opened, the rear canopy departed the aircraft and impacted the tail of the glider. So this was on tow. So imagine that you are, you know, 50 feet above the ground on tow taking off. You hear a thunk and you realize that the rear canopy has just left the glider and it's hit the back of, it hit, it's hit the, the, the rear stabilizer. Fortunately, the glider remained controllable. The pilot released early, landed safely. So basically got up enough altitude to do just a basic circuit, came around, landed safely. The glider was taken out of service for the remainder of the season to effect repairs. That's scenario one. Here's scenario two. Effective threat and error management is done on the ground before launching. So just to give you a little bit of context here, um, they had, pre-launched the glider, it was ready to go, done their checks, and then there was a decision to change runways. So the glider was pulled over to the other runway and the glider pilot climbed in to do their uh, takeoff. In a moment of clarity, they thought, wait a second, I did my checks before, but I've now just reset. In, in during the reset, they'd actually opened the rear canopy to you know pull on straps and maneuver the aircraft. And this pilot said, you know, I'm going to just do a double check and make sure that rear canopy is closed and locked. And they discovered it was not locked. So they caught it. They corrected it. The glider launched. Pilot enjoyed an uneventful flight. And the glider was flown for the rest of the season. Think about that scenario in terms of efficiency, in terms of safety. When we get it right, 
things go smoothly. Uh, a number of years ago, we had um, a Jantar in our club. It was a club air aircraft, and a pilot was preparing for a flight in it. He was off to the side. He had strapped in. He was adjusting the seat, making sure you know everything was good because he hadn't flown the aircraft for a little bit. He put the canopy on to check the fit, but he wasn't ready for launch. And he was asked three times, you know, are you ready for launch? Are you ready for launch? Come on, let's go. A spot came open because someone else wasn't ready, and he finally gave in. And yes, threat and air management, correct. Um, and he finally gave in and, and took the launch spot. Um, when he lowered the undercarriage for landing, the canopy flew off because he had actually flown the entire flight with the canopy unlocked. Now, the good news is it didn't impact the tail of the aircraft. Um, it was recovered undamaged. There was a couple of scratches, no, nothing major. And, you know, our aircraft was able to return to operation, you know, the next day. But for want of a few moments and for that rushing, we introduce these errors. And if we can think about threat and error management, um, this can help us, you know, get in front of this and, and prevent this. So threat and error management, this is active safety versus static safety. And what we're talking about here is a threat that is anything that is a deviation from the norm. So we think about um, a scenario. Let's say you're in your glider, you're on the runway, you're about to launch, another glider enters into the circuit, you decide to not launch, the tow plane pulls off to the side, you release the glider, you know, perhaps you move the glider off to the side to allow that glider to come in and land, and then we move you back onto the runway. Now, in doing all of that, we've put your tail dolly back on, but we've also interrupted the flow. So now what is the threat? What, what, what's the new thing that's happening there? Um, an error is a mistake that we humans make, AKA forgetting to lower your gear, taking off without ballast, those types of things. And then management is that positive or active strategy to prevent or intercept those, such as restarting the checklist when we're being interrupted, such as arriving early on a day you're planning to go for a cross-country flight. So here's a couple of examples. Uh, these are personal examples from my club from the past year. The first one is actually mine. Um, I had stopped flying in uh, 2020 with the pandemic, finally got my third shot, started flying mid-season, it was August. And I went, it came out to the club to fly that day and we had a couple of new members and I climbed into the back seat with a student in the front hooked up the glider, and as the tow plane was taxiing to take up slack, I realized we have not hooked up the tow plane. <laughs> now, this has never happened before, but the threat that led to it was the fact that the person running the rope and the people on the ground were new members and they, they hadn't been properly trained. So instead of identifying that as a threat and saying, okay, well, we need to be extra cautious and careful here, I kind of thought, well, we can kind of, let, let's, let's get the launch going. Um, another member arrived late in the season to rig his personal glider. He had to take it out of the, uh, the box to tra trailer at home. So he had to take it out and pack things up and prepare the trailer for going down the road. So he thought, well, I've got it out of the box. I'll rig it and go for one final flight. Now, this was his sixth flight in that glider in the last two years. Because much like many of us, he was much less uh, active. And... I got a bit of a sense that he was rushing that day. So he, he kind of put his glider together, you know, asked for a bit of help. And then he came down at the end of the field. He actually got on, he rigged, or he positioned the glider for takeoff, climbed in, uh, his tail dolly was still on. So I asked him about that. He's like, ah, oh, crap, sorry. Thanks for catching that. And I said to him, you seem like you're rushing a little bit. Are you okay? Oh yeah, 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 no, no worries. I said, have you done your positive control check? And you just saw the look on his face going, oh crap. Yeah, so we did a positive control check took his tail dolly off for him and he had a good flight. Now he did admit that, you know, he was rushing a bit and he also did admit that, you know, he has flown the aircraft six times in the last two years. So very little. And you get out, you fall out of these, out of these processes. So we put that in the context of threat and error management. And what we have, the threats here are currency, hasn't flown the aircraft very much, six flights in the last two years. Actually it was five flights in the last years because this was the sixth hasn't been very active on the club much in the past two seasons. So these are the threats that are there. What are the errors that led to this? Not doing a positive control check, leaving the tail dolly on while he climbed in for takeoff, these types of things. Uh, the gear down and locked scenario. This was one of our members who fairly recently bought a new glider. 
uh, transitioned to retractable gear, um, and he took a tow, didn't hit some great lift, ended up getting a little bit rushed into the circuit. Um, it was a little bit turbulent. There was a bit of an interruption in the launch sequence. He ended up flying the flight with the gear down, forgetting to retract it. And the classic, time to do my pre-landing checks gear, and he cycled the gear from the down position to the up position and then landed. So we think about those, and if you're sitting here thinking, well, great stories, Dave, but that's never gonna happen to me, you're deluding yourself. We all make mistakes, it's, it's part of who we are. So we wanna think about what are the threats that we're seeing? What errors can that lead to? And what are the things that we could do to manage that? We're gonna do this one in the plenary, and we are actually approaching another break because we're just coming on the hour. So here's what I'm gonna suggest we do. I'm gonna do a seven minute break, and I'm gonna ask you to um, give some thought about this. What are some of the threats that you see as we approach 2022? I'm gonna put the timer off to the side. It's up there. Take a moment to get up, have a stretch, move around. Think about this question. And either now or near the end of our, um, sorry, my timer is not safe. That's weird. Okay, um, I think I'm gonna have to do something with my timer here. Okay, seven minutes, take a break, think about what those threats are, enter some things in, we'll discuss them when we come back. There we go. Final countdown. Okay, welcome back. Ah. So let's take a look at what we've got in terms of uh, feedback on this. Now, the question was, what do we see as threats as we start the 2022 season? I'm loving this first entry here. We're all two years older. <laughs> so a uh, little tip of the hat to the person who put that. Reduced flying proficiency. Now, we have this every season, but honestly, I feel like this year, it's probably a little accentuated. And whoever entered that one, if you wanted to uh, build on that, I would love to hear your thoughts. Uh, making sure the entire operation is safe as we bring back students and fam flights. This is a big issue for a lot of clubs this year. There's uh, one club I was chatting with who had completely paused instruction for two full years. And this year they're gonna be now doing instruction for the first time. Uh, many clubs had reduced instruction over that time. So we've got some currency issues, not only just in the flying portion, but also in the teaching portion. Um, we have new field procedures unpracticed, absolutely. So. Some of us have new procedures we didn't have before. Others have ones that haven't been practiced. So not all members see the need to learn and they avoid learning them. Mm, that's an interesting one, right? Uh, risk of being complacent after not having uh, much flow, having flow much, oh, flown much over the last few years. Not all flarms are upgraded to the recent software. So there's potential technology issues. Um, Two people in Glider in the open COVID world, currency of members that haven't flown much in the last two, two, two seasons, uh, new COVID members, uh, new, new members, COVID background. Um, yeah, we're, we're, I'm actually hearing a number of clubs are getting an uptick in membership. Um, so there's two factors on that. Uh, the first of which, historically, humans, when they come out of a pandemic, they tend to be more adventurous, for lack of a better term. Um, they tend to step in and, and want to do things that maybe they've been putting off. And there's some theories around why we do that, but you're probably gonna see an uptick of people saying, you know what, I've wanted to start gliding, you know, flying all my life, and now I've, I'm finally gonna do it. Um, the other uptick we're potentially seeing, which I know some clubs have been seeing, is cadets, because the cadet operations have been shut down. Um, so we're getting cadets showing up at, at SAC clubs more and more, which is fantastic. 
Um, throwing all COVID related protocols out the window as the pandemic is over. So again, changing our protocols, right? Lack of currency related to threats uh, by all involved in flight operations. Absolutely. So we're getting into that currency thing. Uh, return to public, return of public to the airfield, right? So more intro flights, more rescue pilots. COVID tensions. This is an interesting one. Mask or not mask, for example. Um, um, oh my goodness, his name just jumped out of my head, but the outgoing president of SOSA, he shared a really nice video that he did around the whole COVID thing um, in terms of what they're doing and how they're doing that. Dale, thank you. Um, so as, as Dale Gertner, um, you know, and one of the things he said there is that we're not gonna judge. You know, we're here to welcome each other. We're friends, we're all flying together. If you decide to wear a mask, if you don't feel comfortable not wearing a mask, you know, you need to decide as an organization what that looks like, but also we need to make sure that regardless of our own personal beliefs and understandings and, and approaches, that we need to be accepting of folks and their decisions, right? Um, I'm loving this one in the top right, over-enthusiastic, rushing to achieve goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And for those instructors on the line, we've all had this issue with students who are you know, really wanting to push forward, right? Um, forgetting that everyone is rusty, thinking that uh, we remember things perfectly when in fact we don't, you know, using the same old broken equipment that we didn't get fixed over the winter, accepting things that are, you know, good enough rather than right and safe. So you have some really good points in that one. Uh, many sports are experiencing significant increases in new members. Absolutely, we touched on that earlier. Um, if this is the case with gliding, we could overwhelm some clubs, especially if senior members that would normally take the lead have gotten a bit rusty. Yeah, so we wanna think about as a senior member, as I come back, how rusty am I? How prepared am I and how capable am I in helping those new members come through? And as we get the new members coming in, how are we receiving them and training them? Um, back about 10 years or so ago at Great Lakes, we had this big influx of new members. I don't know what caused it, but we had, you know, it got to a point where we would have almost half and half of new members and, and, you know, seasoned members on the field. And in the past, we've always taken in the new members and just sort of trained them organically. It's like, oh, you know, just come out and we'll sort of lead you around and show you. But we had so many of them that we really needed to be more prescriptive. And, and you know, sadly, we didn't do a fantastic job of it, but we definitely learned a lot. Um, Rust and out of practice, the simulator can help there. Rusty pilots going straight to check out instead of refresher with an instructor. Ooh, love that thought. You know, consider doing a little bit more of a, how about if we, you know, spend a little bit of classroom time, maybe a couple hours to just get ourselves back into the, into the, um, into the flow. Um, don't be too ambitious, love it, yeah. Um, all club, all pilots and club ops need rust remover. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, rushing to start flying before we're, we're fully prepared, you know, complacency. My scroll is happening very slowly here. Rushing to start flying before evaluating all equipment. Love it. Yep. Okay. So we've got some really good um, elements here. I apologize. My computer seems to be running very slowly. Let's see if I can nudge it a little bit. Okay. So we're seeing a lot of commonalities, a lot of themes here, especially the out of practice, the rusty piece, but we're seeing that also layered with the, um, the COVID factors. We're seeing that layered with elements of a longer interruption, potentially up to two years for some folks. Um, when I'm all done here, I do have the recording I'll post. I'll also download all of these into PDFs and, and we'll share them out as well. So we think about what are some of those threats that we have and then how can we address them and how can we you know, arrive back at the field in a way that's going to help us. Um, I wanna share with you, so I shared with you some, some thoughts from Germany, from Sweden. We're now gonna go down to Australia. Uh, this was a Australia gliding uh, bulletin that was sent out resuming safe operations after periods of inactivity. So again, I'm gonna share with you some of their thoughts and what's going on with them. Um, and this is shared with permission. Um, so some safety considerations and lessons. So things like health, you know, the two years older. Um, on break, I was chatting with someone who was saying, you know, I'm, I'm staying on mute mainly because, you know, I've been coughing so much with, from COVID. I mean, there are many people on this call who actually had COVID and are still recovering. 
you know, what are the skill skills decay that's happening, the biases, the attention, the errors, the variables, you know, what are all those sort of things that are that are coming uh, down the pike at us as we get restarted. Um, from the British Gliding Association, there's the pilot currency barometer. If you haven't seen this, more than happy to share it out. Uh, what it looks at is the number of hours and the number of launches in the last 12 months. So for example, let's say I only did 10 launches in the last 12 months. And let's say I only had five hours of flying in the last 12 months, then I would be down here in the red zone as I connect those two dots. This particular example, this person has about 12 launches and they've got about 25 hours. So although they're a higher hours time, they don't have as many launches and then that would put them in the yellow because when you connect those two dots, you, you look at where it crosses the center line. So this is about looking at, you know, how much experience do you have within the last 12 months? How many hours? Um, and, you know, where, would you, where, where do you cross on that line? Um, Jeff, I will post this uh, currency barometer. Where can I put that? If someone has the link for it, that would be fantastic. If not, what I'll do is I'll post it with this video on our YouTube when, when we post it, and we'll make that available. And uh, Jeff, feel free to reach out to me directly, and I can get you a copy. So what are some of the considerations? You know, weather, crosswind, fatigue, long grass, the complexity of the, of the type, you know, what are all the distractions and overloads that happen within all of that? Ah, wonderful. Thank you, Rob. Uh, so the link has been posted into the chat. For that if you're if you want to pick up the currency barometer now one of the considerations to think about is the skills decay so if we started there let's call that a hundred percent you know and then as time goes skills degrade and one of the insidious things about this and we've talked about this in the past is different skills degrade at different rates so it's not a it's not a pure linear fashion procedural procedural memory you know your learned reactions they tend to not degrade too much when we get into the more complex when we get into the higher performance skills these are the ones that degrade more so when we get into that more nuanced pieces um, that's where we can have you know greater decays in our performance and this is where things like condor can be a help because we can be still flying through the winter even if it is on a simulator um, some of the considerations and lessons learned so Australia is part of our network of safety. Um, this list here is a combination that came out. Um, could you present this? Yes, absolutely, George. Um, actually, it's already there. But yeah, I'll make sure it is. Um, so this is a combination of input from Canada, UK, from Sweden, from Finland, from Australia, and from New Zealand. And things like pre-season walk-arounds, pre-season review quizzes, pre-season flight checks. These are all things that, that, you know, these different countries are talking about. Online simulator flights so to help with some of the procedural elements and, and to kind of keep our head in the game. Um, you know, scenario and analysis rehearsal. So the scenario-based training that the U.S. is now doing, we're doing, uh, many countries are doing. And, you know, considering what this looks like in terms of, um, you know, how can we better step into the season? And one concept that I really like is this pairs teams discipline. So really helping as you pair off and you come in with a team discipline, so you're actually watching each other and, and helping support. Now, one of the things that they're doing uh, as well uh, is they've picked up the threat and error management as well. So they've actually put some training around that. And the undesired aircraft state is what we get to, and we want to avoid that. So when we look at this, our goal here is to have a, what we call a pristine flight. And a pristine flight is that flight that goes nice and smoothly with no, with no uh, unusual elements. And when we have those unusual elements, it can re result in this undesired aircraft state. So we want to you know, try to think about what are the threats that could lead us there? What are the errors that could you know, cause that? And how are we gonna manage that? directly from uh, our work in Canada, as well as the work in the UK. So I was invited onto the Thermal podcast for a safety piece last year. Um, you know, we saw this trend of higher insurance accidents with less uh, actual flights happening. Um, statistically speaking, experienced pilots are more at risk. Um, 
you know, there's, there's a number of factors around that. But as we return to more normal flight operations coming out of COVID, the, the too much, too soon, and too many variables, getting some optimism, bias, and some complacency, you know, occurring. Um, I'm very grateful that you're all here today as we talk through this, because this tells me that the complacency is not there and you're, you're spending three hours on a Sunday to go through this with me so that, you know, we can, we can be more vigilant and, and really bring those things in. So all of this distilled down and here is their, their kind of summary of it all. Doing safety right. And this is why I chose the theme of efficiency versus rushing. Because when we do it right, things go smoothly, they happen, you, you, you get the job done faster. That's what efficiency is about. But we're not doing it at the sacrifice of, of risk or of safety. We're actually doing it as a way. So safety will actually lead to this. Um, so building some positive capacity, uh, diversity of opinion, it's okay to voice that dissent. We actually have a, a, a stated policy within our club that any pilot can stop the operation. So if, they, if they're going like something right here, any pilot can call a stop. Um, the risk discussion, having it continue and having going live, um, you know, defer to expertise. This may not be the person in charge. This may not be um, you know, the one, you know, the highest rank, if you will. It's the person who actually knows what they're doing, right? Uh, the ability to say, stop, pause, uh, you know, taking, uh, talking, breaking down those hierarchies. So, you know, having the open conversations, and this is why I was so pleased to receive that incident report from that uh, from that tow pilot who you said, you know, Mia Copa, this was all on me. I made a big mistake here. They had multiple conversations following that, and lots of great learnings. Um, pride of workmanship, I love that one, and that workmanship can be in the form of you know, doing some maintenance work on, a, on an aircraft, but it can also be in the form of how you execute your flight. Um, I chose the image from my visit to Winnipeg a few years back. Um, I was sitting in the back seat of a PW6 when we opened and I gave my pre-flight briefing. And I was really impressed when Mike, um, you know, in the front seat there, his professionalism is he did a pre-flight briefing. Now, Mike and I have known each other for a few years. I consider him a friend, we, we converse quite often. And yet, when we sat into that cockpit, it wasn't my friend Dave in the back seat. It was, this is a pilot who's visiting and we're briefing this and, and Mike is sitting in the front seat and he says, I am PIC of this aircraft and I'm gonna treat that role with the respect and professionalism and, and you know, discipline that it deserves. And it, it's really changed the way I do my pre-flight. You know, so when I climb into the back seat with Jim, um, well, not in the back seat with Jim, but you know, Jim's in the front seat. I'm in the back seat. <laughs> As I climb in to do, you know, a a preseason check, you know what? It, it doesn't matter that Jim and I are friends. No, he is my student. I'm his instructor. We're doing a checkout, or vice versa. We are now, you know, behaving as more professional pilots and going through this. Um, and you know, it's really about you know how we approach this. Okay. Um, safety considerations and lessons, uh, extending I'm safe to are we safe? So while I arrive at the field individually and I, and I run that am I safe, and there's, there's days when I've said I'm not and, I've, and I'm not going to fly, but let's extend that to ask that question, are we safe? I love this next bullet, hasten slowly. That's what efficiency is all about. You're actually going down the path, you're getting things done, but you're not rushing, right? Um, they're suggesting the sterile environment, so cockpits, launch points, you know, that type of thing. Um, fatigue management, which we've already talked a little bit about, some limitations. Let's think about, you know, who's eligible for competitions, who's eligible for cross country, and, and perhaps we want to, you know, bring the, some of those limitations back a little bit as we get restarted, right? What is our risk appetite? What's the risk versus that opportunity? And, and let's, you know, look at threat and error management. And in a very Australian wording, look after your mates and let them look after you. Right, so watch out for your your friends and let them you know watch out for you. Okay, um, many of you are familiar with chess in the air, and um, here are some. Uh, here's a wonderful article that I highlighted in last year's session. I wanted to keep it because I thought it was still very relevant. When we look at the benchmark of commercial aviation, um, 
it's one death per 10 million flight hours, which equivalent to about 1100 years in the air before some one person dies. Um, in gliding, we're at about 50,000 hours. Uh, here in Canada, we're looking at about one death per 27,000 flights. If we assume about an hour of flight on average, because I don't have uh, flight hours, I only have number of flights in my work, um, and that's over the last seven years. So, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of pretty close into the standard or into the, the level that Germany and France is at. Um, if that's not dangerous enough for you, take up base jumping. See, that's one death every 21 hours. So yeah, I'll let you decide if you want to go there. <laughs> so why is accident rates happening? In his analysis, he looked at a number of different factors. About 90% of them are avoidable. And here's what I highlighted, keeping temptation as low as possible, pre-plan those difficult decisions. This is what we're talking about when we talk about threat and error management. Um, I love this entry around worry a little bit. Stay humble, absolutely. Um, never skip the positive control check or the pre-flight takeoff. Make a specific emergency plan for each takeoff. This is what we're talking about when we talk in terms of threat and error management, in terms of how do we you know, do that every single time. And then from a situational awareness piece, speak up. You know, watch out for your mates, let them watch out for you. So speak up when you see something and listen when someone says something. So we have those conversations. Um, so this is just a recap of that. You know, we have some work to do. We can do this if we work it, if we be, uh, apply a little bit of discipline. Now, the middle of the threat and error management is errors. Threats are things that are affected on us, errors are what come from us. It is inevitable we make mistakes, but we don't make mistakes because we're bad people. We don't make mistakes because we're dumb. We don't make mistakes because we're irresponsible and we don't make mistakes for, because we're thoughtless. We make mistakes because we're human, but the better the system is, and when you think about the errors that are being made, was the person set up well? What led to that? And focus on the system and not the people. So when we think in terms of safety practices, we want to shift our focus away from lagging indicators. Lagging indicators looking at last year's accident incident reports. Let's focus on leading indicators. What are the things that you see that are starting to develop that haven't quite developed yet? Like when you arrive at the field, there's 20 people to run your flight operation that day, which you know for Great Lakes is a decent number. And seven of them are brand newbies who have never been on the field before and don't know what's going on. There's a threat. Let's anticipate that before it turns into someone doing something wrong on the field that causes an accident, right? So look for the leading indicators. Use behavior-based reinforcement. So when you see good behavior, reward it. Whenever someone calls a stop to the operation on our field or says, hold on a second, guys, you know, there's something I'm worried about, I make an extra special point of thanking them and appreciating them and recognizing them. In fact, we even have an award for it. Um, you know, do some analysis and action. So look at the data, but then take action. Uh, near miss reporting is good, but also be a safety coach, not a safety officer. It's about coaching people towards those safe behaviors. And this is the learning and teaching piece that we talked about. So I want to ask you, what are you doing if we think in terms of, you know, behavior-based reinforcement, uh, near miss reporting, safety coach, leading indicators, what are some of the things you're doing at your club to help promote safety? <clears throat> and again, the code is at the top. And I'll pop it into the chat again for everyone in case. Leading by example, oh, what a wonderful, kick off to this. Thank you so much. Um, a number of years ago, we had an issue with our students. They were coming in too low over the end of the runway. Now, if, if we land from the east, it's a farmer's field. You can afford to come in low, but we always say, you know, we teach, you know, we want you to be 10, 15 feet above the runway threshold, you know, give you a little bit of margin. And they were, they were hot dogging in it at like two feet. I was like, why, why, why? And then I noticed that the instructors were all hot dogging in at two feet when they're doing their, their, um, guest flights. You know, you come in low so that the people can wave at their, their spouse on the runway. And I asked all the, the instructors, I said, okay, let's all come in at that higher level, like we tell people to, regardless. 
guess what the students started doing? Right, yeah, they all started doing what we were doing, right? Okay. Look out, be watchful. Annual recurrency training, love it. Fly more, oh yes, oh, wish we could all fly more. Um, not staying silent when seeing hazards. I love that one. Thank you for whoever posted that one, right? Speak up, have those conversations, right? Um, annual safety meetings, love that. Yeah, I'm hearing more and more clubs that are having annual safety meetings. Uh, spring checks, online job boards, absolutely, right? So, so we have this, you know, better communication, right? Coaching on procedures, calm corrections. I love that calm corrections. I had a student who came from uh, the Air Cadets one time, and she was very nervous. She was licensed too, which which surprised me, but she was very nervous. And after a couple of flights with her, she turns to me and she says, you know because I actually did some relaxation and stuff with her in the cockpit. It's like, okay, breathe out, drop your shoulders, right? Um, and she said to me, she said, you know, I'm so used to people yelling at me because in that, in that cadet world, it was uh, at least her instructors were, were much more, um, they would yell at her, yeah. Um, make sure your policy uh, that incident reporting is incident reports that are not a way of finding blame all encouraged to submit reports. Absolutely. So let's let's try to make it more of a conversation, right? Um, I have done thorough DI briefings on our LS4, the number of new pilots. Like, can you get solo in it? Love it. Yes. So going through with them and making, you know, having those conversations. Flying Condor 2 with, with club members. Love it. Yeah, some great stuff here. Um, good ground briefing before any flying. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. An anonymous safety reporting slash suggestion box. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little back and forth on the anonymous piece of that, just because I'm like, can we build a culture where it's not punitive so that I don't have to be anonymous? But if you need to be anonymous, absolutely do it. Um, running a ground school, which is open, not just for students, but also to all of our club members so they can refresh their memory. Yes, 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 love that. Um, if you're looking for some support on that, by the way, reach out to me because we've recently um, built a SAC online product that is open to anyone who wants to use it. Um, be critically observant. Love that one. Yes. Uh, be honest about the fact that we are getting older. Oh, sorry. I'm just going to back up on being critically observant. The observations are critical, not the feedback, right? So the feedback is going to be generative. Um, asking lots of questions. You don't know what you don't know, right? Modeling those best practices. Love it. Yep. And encouraging those questions. So as leadership, it's like, you know, thank people for those questions. Um, you know, study the SOP, especially the new parts. Yep. Uh, we just introduced a SAC FERC uh, flight instructor refresher course. Uh, we've got several clubs who are running it this year. So, um, you know, a great way to help, you know, stay fresh and, and get back in there. Balance of encouragement with constructive feedback, open to both. Yep. Slower controlled startup, no rush to get everyone out checked out. Love it. Practice what you preach. Yep. Mentoring those new members. Here's one that I'm really liking, show empathy. Yeah, um, you know, everyone's got different scenarios and situations. Some people have older family members, you know, immune compromised family members at home. Uh, they may be very worried about COVID and, and other factors. Uh, mentoring some new folks. Yeah, loving some things here. Uh, being vigilant about chronic heart, chronic heat headaches. <laughs> Love that one. Yeah, so the whole I am safe. Mm -hmm. Improving safety culture by appealing to the heart. Um, you know, there's discussions around the details, but, you know, decision making. Discuss, discuss making decisions that will get you home safe at the end of the day. Wow, thank you. That's powerful. Um, it's easy for us to say in gliding, what's the big deal? It's just me up there. But there are people waiting for you back home. Absolutely. I'm loving this stuff here. Thank you all so much. Okay. In practice, so this is something that we do at our club. We have the Toilet Seat Award. It's called the Senior Sky Commander. I screwed up, but managed to use my superior good luck, or superior skill and sure good looks to save the day award. This is given to someone who makes a mistake, but then interrupts the chain of events and you know, prevent the accident. Um, the first person to receive it landed in our K6 in a field beside the runway because he realized partway through the circuit 
that he was way too low and was not going to be able to complete a proper circuit. And when it dawned on him, he did the best choice he could, which was to land in the field that was in front of him. Dehydration and fatigue was factors in that, absolutely. Um, Dave there, who's receiving the award, uh, he was the gentleman I, I shared with you earlier, he forgot to uh, lock the, the Jantar canopy. And the reason we gave him the award is because he did a perfect circuit and a perfect landing in spite of having just lost the canopy like literally moments before. So it's about celebrating the wins. And when you have someone who makes a mistake, but they catch it and they break the chain of events and it does not turn into an accident or get much worse, that's something to celebrate. Because if we chastise someone for making a simple mistake, yeah, it's not, it's not, gonna, it's not a good way to go. All right, so what are some of the things we can do about this? There's some awareness we can build, which is what we're doing today. We'll talk a little bit about briefly about some tools and some help. Your brain is a self-limiting mechanism. It can only truly focus on one thing at a time. What we do is we task swap. So we focus on this, then we switch to this, then we switch to this. The more we practice, the more that we do things on a regular basis, the less time and attention we need on a particular task to get it done. This is why we're talking about efficiency today. All of this is amplified by fatigue and stress. So that when you're tired, when you're stressed, you lose ability to deal with multiple things happening all at once. It's reduced through practice, skill, and development. Um, I know there are some conversations around checklists. For any instructor here, and students will relate to this as well, how long does it take you to go through your pre-landing checklist, assuming you started high key and you're going on the, on the downwind? Take a student who's flying their first circuit and ask them to do the pre-landing che pre checklist and fly the circuit. They're overwhelmed. They'll be turning base. <coughs> Excuse me. They'll be turning base. And they haven't got through the checklist yet. And meanwhile, as a seasoned pilot, as an instructor, you know we can whip through that checklist so fast. Why? Because we've practiced it, right? So now it becomes something I can do very quickly as where it's gonna take a student much longer. So as we practice and do our skill development, we can reduce the amount of time and energy it takes. <clears throat> I've talked about this before, stress versus pressure. Stress improves your performance, pressure reduces. Now, this work was done around the turn of the century, 1908. <clears throat> as you increase stress arousal, you increase performance. Think about your performance when you're bored. You don't do well, right? This is why if you go to a busy restaurant, you get better service than if you go to an empty restaurant. There's an old saying, if you want something done, take it to someone who's busy. But we can also overload people. We can give them too much. So we've got to you know, help sort of figure out where that per perfect spot is. Pressure is defined where the outcome is important, the outcome is uncertain, and you feel like you're being judged. <clears throat> As leaders within our clubs, we can reduce the feeling of being judged by the type of culture that we set. If we have a culture that penalizes mistakes, we are increasing the level of being judged because I'm watching every single one of your landings. And if it's wrong, I'm gonna come and tell you about it and I'm gonna wag my finger and we're gonna have a conversation, right? Versus let's have these open, honest conversations about that and, and you know helping with that. Outcome is uncertain. We can reduce that through practice. Right, so the more we fly, the more that we get to develop those skills, the more we can make this less uncertain as to what the outcome is like. <clears throat> the outcome is important. This is all relative. It is less important to put the glider down on the numbers than it is to have it safely on the runway. So you get someone who gets so stressed about putting it down on the numbers, they'll crash the airplane. Versus, you know what, I landed long, okay. You know, I, I can improve my ability to do spot landings, but you know what the important thing is here is we're down and safe. And this is why we celebrate when everyone, someone makes the decision that they're not gonna make it back and they choose a good field and they safely outland with no damage. Okay. Pressure adversely impacts your cognitive success. It downgrades your performance. Um, most people will perform below their capacity. It's often camouflaged. And we're feeling this you know, constant set of pressure these days. So what do we do? We can do visualization, we can do preparation. Uh, we can you know, try to remove some of that judgment, remove the, reduce the perceived importance of things. 
<clears throat> in the tools area, we have lots of checklists. I'm going to share one with you in the store. What's my current situation? This picture was taken at about 2 a.m. My dog woke me up, it was just before Christmas, and my neighbor's car was on fire. So this is the house beside me. <laughs> What's the situation? Oh, neighbor's car is on fire. What are my options? Well, I could go back to bed and do nothing. I could phone the fire department, you know, knock on some doors and wake people up and get them out of their house. Um, by the way, right beside that car was also a propane fuel tank for my other neighbor's house. Took action, phoned the fire department, knocked on some doors, got people out. I took this picture after people were safely out of their homes. We're standing there watching the fire, waiting for the fire department to arrive. And of course, then you just repeat. It's a constant process. You're doing this over and over and over again. And the whole, tool, the whole objective here of this tool is to break that chain. So as you see the chain of events developing, right? So this is why we have things like a um, critical assembly check that you do after you assemble your glider, right? This is why we do checklists while we're assembling them and do this, the, the secondary check after. You know, getting another pair of eyes to look at your glider before you, you know, climb it and fly. Getting, you know, a, a wing runner to do a quick check with you before they hook you up and launch you, that type of thing. On the health side, we want to arrive at the field in as healthy a state as possible. So did we have a good sleep? Have we had breakfast? Um, when I trained with the air cadets, we had a hard rule. If you skipped breakfast, if you skipped lunch, you did not fly, period, right? So imagine that you woke up late. You didn't get a good sleep. You slept past your alarm. You know, you grab a, a Pop-Tart on the way out the door, maybe just a coffee, you arrive at the field, you know, you don't have any, you know, lunch packed, you leave for your long cross-country flight, you're not setting yourself up for success, right? So did you get good sleep? Are you nourished properly? You know, are you want to avoid hypoglycemia? You know, do you have enough water for the flight? And especially if you're working in the higher elevations, you know, what's your oxygen levels like? Okay, we've already talked about the stress. We're gonna shift the stress conversation slightly to talk about acute stress versus chronic stress. Acute stress is a visible and immediate threat. <laughs> Hopefully no lions in our airfield. Chronic is that ongoing piece, what we often feel, especially with work. Um, talking to a doctor pilot friend of mine, I asked him this question, what's, what, what's your take on acute versus chronic stress? And this was his answer verbatim. Acute stress gets your heart rate up. Chronic stress st just stops it. We respond to acute stress quickly. We get adrenaline, cortisone, norepinephrine. Um, this is what we've talked about in the past around the amygdala hijack piece. Um, and this comes out of the uh, Harvard University Health Sciences Department. But it's also followed by a rest recovery phase. So you think about this, you're driving to work, you're driving to the airfield and someone cuts you off and almost gets into an accident with you. Oh, heartbeats up, adrenaline's up, cortisol, norepinephrine's flowing. Wow, what the heck, you're mad at them, you swear, you have gesture and so on. Okay, I need a breath. Let's, let's you know, rest and recover for a moment. This is part of the reason why I so loved that tow pilot's post. Because he had a moment like that. He had a moment of acute stress, narrowly averted, a mid-air collision, and he says, I need to rest and recover. I need to take a pause. When we have acute stress, our, our response is flee, fight, freeze. This is our amygdala jumping in. This is our fight, flight response. This is a basic survival instinct. It's hardwired in your brain. The sooner we can get in front of that, the less effect it'll have on us, the more it's allowed to develop. Okay, so this is what threat and air management's about. Do you have a nice, calm day, clear runway with well-cut grass? You know, you've got an aircraft that's in good shape. You're planning, you know, just a local flight. You know, what does that look like? Versus are you dealing with, you know, muddy, boggy bits in the runway that you need to avoid? You've got a heavy crosswind. Maybe you've got someone running the wing who doesn't really know what they're doing. There's tall grass to contend with. What are the threats that are there that's going to potentially cause you trouble? And then how can we manage those? Here's how we respond to chronic stress. And I took this off the Mayo Clinic website. Long-term activation of stress response system and overexposure to cortisol and other stress hormones that follows can disrupt almost all 
body's processes. It went on to talk about you're at increased risk for anxiety, depression, digestive problems, headaches, heart disease, sleep problems, memory concentration impairment. I'm looking at that list and thinking none of these I want in the cockpit. Right? So let's think about how we can reduce our chronic stress. Whoops, sorry, apologies, went one too far. Um, we are not designed for chronic stress in very simple terms. So we're gonna take about two minutes on this one. What are some of the chronic stressors that you have in your life right now? Hmm. In work, not surprising. War is up there pretty big. COVID, family. That I always find that one fascinating because yeah, family is one of our our biggest um, best places to be, but it can also be some of our biggest stressors, for sure. For sure. Loving these answers, guys. Thank you. Inflation, work, no work. Um, Politics is popping in there, and I'm guessing that's both club politics as well as world politics. We see some other elements. I noticed surgery was in there, sick parent. Um, so you're going to see some very personal ones. Um, health is in there, um, you know, workload, dependence. Um, yeah, there's a lot of factors here, right? And some of them are very personal. Some of them are very unique to individuals. And this is where our empathy can come in. But, you know, yeah, work is always a challenge. COVID is a big, is a big one. It's gonna be for a couple more years probably. Um, yeah, so there's some factors there. When we think about what we can do as individuals to help not only ourselves, but also others, right? And how we can, um, you know, really help our, our you know, as the Australians are saying, look out for your mates and let them look out for you. So to summarize here, we talked about awareness. There's awareness of ourselves, awareness of others. So things like the I am safe, recognizing what are some of the stressing factors that both we see and others see. Some of the tools we can reduce and focus our workload through habits. We can manage safety through checklists. Currency is a big tool for that as well. Um, health, Looking at, you know, yeah, some of the stress is good. We'll raise to the, to the level of that performance, but we also need to make sure that we're balancing that, right? Absolutely. So uh, we've got two final little very quick bits to finish us off today. Who's responsible for implementing safety? So I've got a couple of different groups here, board of directors, pilots, instructors, students. What are your thoughts? Who's responsible for safety? <laughs> that that was very um <laughs> yeah yeah all of us we all are yeah absolutely yeah all of the above all of us <laughs> Dave Donaldson that's scary if you're relying on me we're in big trouble folks all right <laughs> Yeah, I agree, everybody is. Um, so we're gonna finish off with a little piece of application and this is called the I commit to. And what I'm gonna ask you for in a few moments is to publicly declare your I commit to statement. Now, these are gonna be done anonymously. Uh, we're gonna use Menti again, but I want you to declare that and I want you to think about potentially doing that with your club uh, when you get back you know, online. 
And the key here is the word I. This is what you as an individual are committing to. This is not, oh, I'm going to commit to, you know, getting my students to follow the procedures or, or you know, that notes. So this is what are you doing? You've got them on screen, so I'm going to let you. Oh, why is that scrolling? Hmm. Should be scrolling. All right. I'm going to just let you read them. Some really good stuff. Ooh, 100 hours of flight time to see. I like that one. Here's a good one, being receptive to criticism, liking that. Mm. I commit to recap six elements of this presentation at my club. Happy to share the slides with you, um, whoever put that. If anyone wants any support in doing their spring safety sessions, or if you're seeing any materials that you want, please reach out to me. I like this one, not getting airborne before I am before feel I'm safe. Fantastic, everyone. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to read a couple that uh, popped in. Actually, one that popped in on the chat. Having fun. I commit to having fun. I like that one. Thank you. It is important that we have fun. I mean, that's what we're here for, right? And the more we're having fun, the more likely we are to actually be efficient and be safe. Okay. As I said, I will post um, the recording of this session. Um, I will also share out materials with all of the safety officers. I'm going to ask for my second round of attendance. Um, so if everyone can pop in and put in their name and license number. I will be matching that up with what you posted at the beginning. We'll give everyone a few moments for that. And I'm seeing some thank yous pop in on the chat. You're most welcome and thank you all for what you brought to today because um, I can only do my part and I appreciate you all doing yours. And I'm gonna stop the recording here.